In modern times, we are blessed because we have cars, trains and planes that can take us across long distances in a short amount of time. Well, some of you may already know this, but in ancient China many years ago, they didn't have cars, trains or planes. All they had were horses and their two, or sometimes one, trusty old feet. Ancient China for many parts of its history was vast in area, so finding efficient means of transportation for humans and cargo was important. So how did they figure out this problem? They built the world's longest man-made river. G'day everyone, I'm your host Stephen and welcome to another episode of the Bamboo History Podcast. For those of you who are new, woo, welcome! The Bamboo History Podcast is a podcast that focuses on Chinese and East Asian history. If this type of content is up your alley, please subscribe to my podcast to keep up to date with my latest episodes and to also tune in to my existing ones. I also have an Instagram too, at Bamboo History Podcast, which features visual content for my episodes, teasers, and extra historical content. So please follow my Instagram too. Thanks. To all my existing listeners, thanks again. Xie xie, mgai, muchas gracias for your continued support. Alright, now let's get straight into it. Today's episode will cover the Grand Canal in China. The Grand Canal is known in Chinese as the Da Yun He, which literally translates into English as Big Canal. If you don't know what a canal is, it is an artificial waterway or river that is created by humans primarily for drainage management or water transportation. The Grand Canal wasn't actually the first canal the Chinese built. In fact, Chinese people have been using canals for thousands of years. The first recorded canal built was called the Hango, spelt H-A-N-G-O-U, and was built by King Fu Chai, spelt F-U-C-H-A-I, of the Kingdom of Wu, spelt W-U, during the Spring and Autumn period which he constructed from the year 486 BCE. The Spring and Autumn period was a period in which China was fragmented into many different kingdoms and states. The Kingdom of Wu was one of them, located in southern China, and in order to expand his kingdom, King Fu Chai needed to invade his northern neighbour, the Kingdom of Qi, spelt Q-I. Hence, Fu Chai constructed the Hangul Canal to help transport manpower and supplies to the northern borders of his kingdom. The canal was constructed to connect the Yangtze River with the Huai River to the north and greatly assisted the Wu in defeating the Qi and acquiring new territories, making the Wu a dominant kingdom during the spring and autumn period at that time. So I know you've got some questions now like, Oh, then what about the Grand Canal then? When did that happen? Why aren't you telling me that yet? Oh, well, that's the topic, isn't it? Why, blah, 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 yeah. All right, all right, listeners, hold your horses. I'm getting to it. The Grand Canal itself was constructed a thousand years later after the Hangul Canal, during the Sui Dynasty. Sui, spelt S-U-I. The Sui dynasty lasted between the years 581 to 618 CE and was a meagre 63 years. However, despite its short existence, the Sui dynasty was important because it united China for the first time in almost 400 years. The 400 year period before the Sui dynasty was a hectic period where China was fragmented into different territories. This was also a period where foreigners especially nomadic peoples north of China, had invaded and conquered large parts of northern and central China, which was the heartland of the Han Chinese. As a result, many Han Chinese people migrated south, and this resulted in a population spike in southern China. Hence, when the Sui dynasty united China in the year 581, southern China had become more vibrant and prosperous due to the population shift through waves of migration over the past hundreds of years, especially in the Jiangnan area. Jiangnan spelt J-I-A-N-G, 
N-A-N. The Jiangnan area is the area south of the lower reaches of the Yangtze River and is presently the Chinese provinces of Jiangsu, Zhejiang and Anhui. If you guys don't know where that is, it's basically the area around Shanghai. The Jiangnan area was, and still is, filled with natural lakes, rivers and other waterways and was basically an agricultural paradise. Like it was the game Farmville on steroids. This in turn attracted many Han Chinese to the area, and as a result, the Jiangnan region became an economic hub and was poppin', with many vibrant cities springing up, such as Yangzhou, Y-A-N-G, Z-H-O-U, which still exists and is 300 kilometers northwest of modern Shanghai. When the second emperor of the Sui dynasty ascended the throne in the year 604, he knew it was important to access the wealth and resources and the girls of the Jiangnan region. This emperor was known as the Emperor Yang of Sui, Yang spelt Y-A-N-G. So in the year 605, he ordered the construction of the first part of the canal, known as Tongji Chu, or known in English as the Tongji Channel, Tongji spelt T-O-N-G-J-I. The Tongji Channel began in the Sui dynasty capital of Luoyang, spelt L-U-O-Y-A-N-G, a city in central China, to Yangzhou in the Jiangnan region. The Tongji Channel was a whopping 650 kilometers, or 400 miles for the American listeners. For the construction of such a long canal, you'd think it'd take years to complete, right? Eh, wrong. It only took six months, starting from March and finishing in August the same year. Six months, ses meses. That's even less than a pregnancy. Chinese people have a knack of completing big projects in a short space of time. I mean, look at modern China's high-speed rail network. It's taken them less than 10 years to build 10,000 kilometers worth of train tracks. Astounding, isn't it? Meanwhile, in Australia, there is a wait time of up to 10 years for one singular train track. It's basically Usain Bolt versus Stephen the Bamboo History Podcast host in a 100 meter sprint. Like obviously I'm faster, right? <laughs> After the Tongji Channel was constructed, three years later, in the year 608, Emperor Yang ordered the construction of the Yongji Chu. The Yongji Chu is also known in English as the Yongji Channel and Yongji is spelt Y-O-N-G-J-I. The Yongji Channel was even longer, and was around 900 kilometers, or 560 miles, and connected the capital, Luoyang, to the northern regions of the Sui Dynasty, with the canal ending in Zhuojun, spelt Z-H-U-O-J-U-N. Zhuojun is where the city of Beijing is today. Construction of the Yongji Channel finished in the year 611. The Yongji, Tongji and a few other smaller canals were all combined to form the original Grand Canal of China. It is important to note that the Grand Canal was not man-made in all sections. Rather, it also utilised existing rivers and lakes by connecting into these natural waters and then flowing out of them. By connecting natural rivers together, boats could travel not just to the areas served by the Grand Canal, but also to other areas via the natural waterways that the canal had linked up with. Listeners might be wondering, why did Emperor Yang invest so much money, time and labour into building the Grand Canal? I believe there were two main reasons. We touched on the first point already and that was to improve transportation links through the empire and gain access to resources. Because the Sui dynasty was a united Chinese empire, it was large, meaning it was important to have a more efficient means of transportation for items such as food supplies. For example, the Tongji Channel brought wealth and resources from the rich Jiangnan region to central and northern China, including Luoyang, the capital and the political centre of the Sui dynasty. The Yongji Channel went north from Luoyang and helped the empire transport supplies and other materials to equip the armies 
who were guarding the empire against external threats from the nomadic tribes north of the Chinese border. The second reason why Emperor Yang built the Grand Canal was to consolidate power. When Emperor Yang's father established the Sui dynasty, he had been supported by powerful aristocratic families. These families are known in Chinese as Shi Zhu, spelt S H I Z U. In particular, the Shi Zhu families that had supported the emperor's claim to the throne were powerful families from northern China. However, by the time Emperor Yang ascended the throne, the northern Chinese Shi Zhu families had accumulated a lot of power in the empire, and this made Emperor Yang sweat like Snoop Dogg. I just wanna make you sweat, 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 sweat. I just wanna make you sweat, sweat. Okay. Yeah. The most effective way it seemed to curb the power of the northern Chinese Shi Zhu families was to balance it out with the southern Chinese Shi Zhu families. Emperor Yang believed that by connecting the south with the north using a canal, the southern Chinese families could greater exert their influence within the empire, creating a counterweight to the northern Chinese families and balancing out the power. It's also interesting to note that Emperor Yang's first wife, the Empress Xiao, spelt X-I-A-O, was also from southern China as well. So it was said that part of the reason of building this Grand Canal was so that the Empress Xiao would have more opportunities to go visit her family home in the south. There's also a popular third reason, and it was that the Grand Canal was built so Emperor Yang could go to the wealthy Jiangnan region to play and have fun with the women from that area, because apparently the Jiangnan region was famous for good-looking women. This line of reasoning was depicted in a Chinese TV drama called The Heroes of the Sui and Tang Dynasty, known in Chinese as Sui Tang Yingxiong Zhuan. In this TV drama, it shows that Emperor Yang built the canal with the desire to pick up girls from the Jiangnan region. I've watched this drama and uh, yeah, it's alright. Whilst I think this would have been an interesting reason, I doubt this would have actually happened. I mean, if he wanted to travel down there himself, he could have just gone to... He didn't have to build a canal that cost so much time, money and labour. He could have just gone there by land with his entourage. And also, I don't know if you know, but maybe, just maybe, relying on a fantasy TV drama as a historical source is not the most accurate way of learning about history? I don't know. The Grand Canal certainly helped Emperor Yang achieve his goals. However, it came at a cost. A heavy cost. A heavy human cost. You know how I mentioned earlier that the Tongji Channel only took around 6 months to complete? Well, you want to know why? Because almost a million people were taken from their homes and forced to build the canal, often working under horrible conditions. More than a million people were also used to build the Yongji Channel as well. It was recorded that to build the Yongji Channel, and I'll read the text in Chinese first. Sui Yang Di, Zhao Fa Hebei, Zhu Jun Nan Nu Bai Yu Wan, Kai Yongji Chu. What this text means is that Emperor Yang ordered hundreds of thousands of men and women in the Hebei region to construct the Yongji Channel. Yeah, did you hear that? Men and women. Women were also sent to work as labourers too. Possibly because they were running out of men to do the job. This already kind of shows you what kind of man Emperor Yang is. Let's imagine that you were one of these workers. You know, perhaps you're a young, handsome boy. You know, like me. And, <laughs> and, and you're just living a peaceful and comfortable life. When suddenly, you are dragged away by soldiers and forced to work on building something that honestly has just got nothing to do with you. You think to yourself, Ah, oh, it's alright, I think it'll be easy. I'll just find an excavator machine, push some buttons and joysticks, and all this dirt and soil removal will be easy. Yeah, nah, it's not the 21st century, mate. Unfortunately, it's the year 608, and a soldier comes over to you and gives you a little old shovel. He says, All right, Stephen, here you go, mate. Now start digging. And then, you spend days, 
weeks and months digging holes, digging more holes, and even more holes, and even more holes like there's no tomorrow. You aren't wearing any gloves, and as you dig, you wince in pain as the shovel handle rubs against the blisters and calluses that have formed on your palms, with the blood running down from the cuts on your hands. You're like, let's take a break, shall I? You want to take a break, but as you sit down, what was that? There's no breaks. You stop for a split second, someone cracks a whip at you, and you're basically faced with more pain. Now, picture the same thing as well, but this time, you're a woman instead. Yeah, I just cannot imagine the suffering that the workers had to endure just to please one man and to have the Grand Canal built in record time. So apparently I read that around 3.5 million people were called on to build the Grand Canal, and reportedly 2.5 million people died building the canal in the process. That's almost three quarters. Jeez. Jeez Louise. <sighs> Unlike modern times, workers back then lacked the machinery and technology to build things efficiently and safely, like how it can be done these days. This, added with the poor working conditions and the lack of rest to finish the project in record time, most likely caused such a high mortality rate. The loss of such a massive amount of labour was devastating to the Sui Empire. As many of the labourers were from rural areas, the loss of them meant a loss of opportunities to grow crops, which caused agricultural production to plummet. As ancient China was an agrarian society relying heavily on farming and agriculture, this crashed the Chinese economy. Adding fuel to the fire was the dissatisfaction of the civilians at their emperor for being so indifferent to their suffering, and eventually revolts broke out. The Sui dynasty fell into disarray, and less than 10 years after the Grand Canal was built, Emperor Yang was killed, and the Sui dynasty ended in the year 618. Wow, 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 the end. Emperor Yang perhaps wasn't the best emperor China had, and the Grand Canal at the time caused unrest and disaster amongst the people. But it was, in my opinion, his greatest positive contribution from a long-term perspective. The Grand Canal proved to be very useful in future dynasties. The dynasty after the Sui, the Tang Dynasty, relied heavily on the Grand Canal to transport food supplies from the southern Jiangnan region to the northern and central parts of China, such as rice, grains and salt. Cities along the Grand Canal also benefited greatly, the best example being Kaifeng, spelt K-A-I-F-E-N-G, a city in central China. Kaifeng was the capital of the first half of the Song Dynasty, from the 900s to the 1100s. The canal ran straight through the city, via the Bianhe River, B-I-A-N-H-E, and the city became a transport, commerce and trading hub, with 3,000 to 7,000 ships passing through the city every year during its heyday. The Grand Canal had one last major change though. When the Mongols conquered the Song Dynasty and established the Yuan Dynasty in the late 1200s, the political centre was shifted north, with the capital city set in Beijing, which was called Da Du back then. Da Du spelt D-A-D-U. The first emperor of the Yuan dynasty, Kublai Khan, grandson of the great Genghis Khan, was annoyed that the Grand Canal didn't go directly south to the Jiangnan region, but rather snaked southwest first to Luoyang and Kaifeng, then going southeast, effectively making a huge detour. To fix this, Kublai commissioned a change of course of the Grand Canal, and in the years 1289 and 1291, two new canals were created. The first one was called the Hui Tung Canal, spelt H-U-I-T-O-N-G, and the second one was called the Tung Hui Canal, spelt T-O-N-G-H-U-I. These new canals subsequently connected the capital Da Du, or Beijing, directly with the existing rivers and canals that led to southern China, creating a direct north-south link. The new Grand Canal had shortened the trip from Da Du in northern China to Hangzhou in southern China by about 900 kilometers or 
560 miles, and became known as the Jing Hang Da Yun He, or the Beijing Hangzhou Canal. Today, the Grand Canal that we see in modern times is actually the new Grand Canal, and to this day, many Chinese people still use this canal for travel and transportation, even though other means of transport, such as planes, trains, ships and tractors now exist. Unfortunately, the sections of the old Grand Canal that didn't form the new Grand Canal gradually wasted away due to the lack of maintenance and use. The cities along these old sections have also unfortunately withered along with it. For example, Kaifeng is still around today, but as a much smaller and more insignificant city, and I don't think it will ever achieve its former glory, but still a good place to check out if you're a tourist. The Grand Canal is the world's longest man-made waterway, with the new Beijing to Hangzhou Canal estimated to be around 1,700 kilometers. The canal has been important for pumping life into many successive Chinese dynasties. <laughs> Kudos to those who got the pumping pun. <laughs> and is a symbol of ancient Chinese engineering and construction skills. I think what I learnt most about this story is that often investments might seem disastrous or a bad idea in the beginning, but it might pay off later on. Emperor Yang, for instance, spent a fortune building this canal to the cost of his own empire and his own life. Never would he have imagined or felt that when he died, that he would have thought, oh, the Grand Canal was such a good idea and investment. However, he didn't realise that he would actually benefit many lives later on with the Grand Canal. Actually, of course he didn't realise that because he was dead. And today, whilst he is still viewed as a not-so-good emperor, the Grand Canal is a big positive tick for his reign. Yeah, so yeah, that's the takeaway from today's episode, listeners. Uh, take some risks and put your faith into things even if they don't look appealing at the beginning. And yeah, that's it. That's the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed today's episode on the world's longest man-made river. A reminder to subscribe to my podcast to tune into more exciting content like this. I've also got an Instagram too, at Bamboo History Podcast, which features visual content for my episodes and extra historical content. So please do check out my Instagram and follow me there too. Thanks, mates. Okay, time for me to sail off down the canal. Thanks everyone for tuning in, and I hope to see you all next time on the Bamboo History Podcast. Bye for now. Bye-bye.